We're here today with Stu Friedman, professor at Wharton and author of the new book, Baby Bust, New Choices for Men and Women in Work and Family. Welcome, Stu. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. It's great to be uh, here with you again and in this conversation that's been going on for, for decades but is really highlighted, I think, in the discussions uh, happening today. In this new book of yours, you raise some provocative issues about work and family mm -hmm. uh, for today's students and also for uh, generations. It joins a conversation uh, that's been going on for a long time. And you know, recently we've seen comments from Amory Slaughter, from Sheryl Sandberg, uh, the actions of Marissa Meyer. What, as I read this book, I really felt like you were compelled to write it. So what compels you on this topic? Well, uh, there's a, both a personal reason and a professional one. I originally got into this topic area when my first son was born, now 26 years ago. And uh, when I met him for the first time, I was uh, overwhelmed by this question that I just couldn't get out of my head. And that was, what am I going to do to make the world a safe place for him to grow up in? Mm -hmm. Which was a question that I hadn't really thought much about before I met him. Um, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so when I got back into my Wharton classroom about a week or so later, um, I, I framed the question in, in a slightly different way for the students. Uh, future business leaders of the world, how are you thinking about the development, not so much of talent in mm -hmm. the next generation, but of people? Mm -hmm. uh, and what does that mean for you professionally as well as personally in your own life? And how are you going to figure out how to do that in, right. in, in your own world? And, and that created quite a stir in the classroom because, first of all, they had prepared a case on motivation and reward systems. And I had put that aside for the day. And they weren't very happy about that. But uh, some people were quite upset about the fact that I was talking about family and kids. Uh, Others were upset because they didn't really want to hear about my personal life. Uh, but quite a few were really grateful and interested in the questions that I was challenging them with mm -hmm. as I just started to rant on this issue completely unprepared. Uh, <clears throat> and they turned the question around to me and said, well, you know, I don't know what to do why don't you tell us, since you're the professor? Right. Uh, and so that began a conversation that's now been going on for almost three decades now uh, that I've had with students, alumni, and business leaders, government officials uh, all over the world. So it started as a, as a very personal question for me, uh, but it very soon became one that I could see uh, was important to my students, uh, to our school, uh, and to our, our businesses and our society. And so I, I began a research program to try to answer some of those questions. That's fantastic. And, and I, I can absolutely relate. We think about uh, our own lives as professionals, but also as parents. Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I know I sit across from you as a father myself. Mm -hmm. um, you're a father. You have, uh, you have two sons and a daughter. Mm -hmm. And so this, this isn't just an academic exercise. Definitely not. It's very personal. Who do you really hope reads this book? Um, and who might it be difficult for? Well, so one of the things that we started to do with the Wharton Work Life Integration Project, which we started in 1991, was to survey uh, students and alumni. So uh, the class of 1992 undergrads, we asked almost all of them, responded to uh, hundreds of questions about their lives, their careers, their values, their aspirations, their hopes, their dreams. Um, and that became the, the basis for this book uh, when 20 years later uh, we asked the same questions of the class of 2012 and went to explore what we could discover about how things have changed. Um, and what just popped off the, the screen as we were looking at the initial findings was this, this result uh, in response to the question, do you plan to have or adopt children? Yes, probably, not sure, probably not, or no. In 1992, 78% said yes. In 2012, 42% said yes. Yeah, I scratched my head and thought, Is that, can that be right? And it was. Uh, and so then th the question was why? And that's what the book tells the story of, is, is why that has uh, changed so much, the interest in having children or planning to have children, and uh, how it's different for men and for women. And so 
as you pointed out at the start, the conversation has changed. New voices have entered the conversation. There are new norms evolving among young people and senior people about how to integrate the different parts of life in a way that work. When I first started asking these questions, it was, it was very strange to be a man asking questions about work and family. It was almost all women uh, you know, yeah. exploring that question. Uh, but being a man at Wharton, uh, talking about families and kids, it uh, it made me kind of uh, different mm -hmm. and strange, and so I got a lot of attention as a result, just because of you know who I was, not so much what I was doing, but mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the quality of it, uh, and and that brought um, a lot of interest in what we were doing here at Wharton, right. uh, and and it's it's uh, something that uh, you know the school. Um, is, was highly supportive of, mm -hmm. uh, and being in the vanguard of, of uh, interest in this topic. Now, how is it that uh, that that it's become difficult for some people to talk about? I think the the most challenging audience, uh, or the most challenged audience, would be uh, business leaders and, and social policy uh, makers, because what's what we observe in the data is that people's attitudes and values have changed. But our, our social institutions and our government policies and our business practices haven't. They are still built around a model of family that has a single earner uh, with, with a mom at home taking care of the kids. And that's just not the norm anymore. So I think it's most challenging for those people who have uh, you know, the most responsibility for thinking about the direction of those, of those institutions. Um, so the, the really striking statistic that you know you open the book with and you talk about um, this big decline in the percentage of people who, you know, a percentage of our undergraduate students mm -hmm. who want to have children or, or are sure they're going to have children. Um, is there a gender difference in that response? No. No, it's exactly the same for men and women. So, so 78, 79 percent men and women right. in 92 and then 42, 43 percent for men and women in, in 2012. I'd like to dig into some of the findings, yeah. right? And what you really discovered about men and about women from, from your surveys and your conversations. One of the things that you note is that you're really seeing a change in life priorities among men. Can you describe what that, what that change looks like over these last 20 years? Uh, men are somewhat more focused on career and, and a little bit less on family. And that's, that's the general trend there. Um, at the same time, more men who are interested in becoming fathers are interested in being more involved right. as fathers. Uh, and they don't see themselves as the sole breadwinner anymore. Uh, in 92, the Gen Xers, the men in that era, mm -hmm. were still of a mindset that was pretty traditional. Uh, but today's men, we don't see that. Uh, they expect their spouses to be full-time engaged in careers. Mm -hmm. uh, they also expect to be working a lot more hours, men and women. Mm. So the, num the average number of expected hours per week has gone from 58 hours per week in 92 to 72 in 2012. That's 14 hours per week more. Right. Uh, but most importantly, young men today expect more conflict between work and family. And that's one of the big inhibitors of their willingness to commit to being parents because uh, it, it, it's, they don't see how they can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, uh, the, it, to the extent that they carry a lot of student debt, that's another factor that um, constrains men uh, right. in their willingness to think about the prospect of having children. It's not that they don't want it so much, although that has gone down some. The, the, the idea of being a parent, mm -hmm. it's how do I make it happen uh, in, in light of all these uh, new pressures. Sure, sure. And, and you talk in the book about students today, and I, th I think this applies to both men and women, mm. they don't expect permanence. They're, yeah. leaving, they're leaving college and going out into the work world, uh, and they have a different view of career paths. Can, yes, they do. Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, uh, that was quite striking. Uh, now, this is the generation that were uh, in their very formative years during 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, and that had a profound impact on them and the class of 92, and this came through very powerfully in the interviews that we did. Um, but in addition, uh, as has been noted by many people studying uh, the millennial generation, they are much more mobile, mm -hmm. uh, much less you know, committed to organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this particular class, 2012, they entered college 
uh, as the Great Recession hit. Mm -hmm. So their sense of um, insecurity about sure. their economic futures is particularly acute. Uh, and all those factors lead them to be um, more interested in moving faster uh, into career tracks that are going to give them security. The next question I'd like to ask you is about, about women. Yes. So one of the things that really stood out to me was this change in perception among young women as they're leaving college that it used to be selfish to want a career, right? Mm -hmm. And now they feel like it's selfish to want children. <laughs> I mean, in the conversations that you're having with them, um, how, are they, how do they deal with um, that kind of perception, that kind of sentiment? Well, one of the pieces of what I see as good news in mm -hmm. this story is that uh, more people, women and men, mm -hmm. are willing and able to say, I don't want to have children. Mm. And for women, I, especially, I see this as a kind of social progress mm -hmm. in, in human evolution. Uh, every generation prior to the current one, mm -hmm. uh, you know, women have been you know, normatively mm -hmm. sanctioned to think of themselves as mothers. You know, there's mm -hmm. almost a, a mindless march into motherhood through, throughout history. Mm -hmm. that, that question hasn't really been raised. Today, young women are saying, I don't feel a need to do that. Got it. And so it's that, an opening up of choices in Exactly. Some way. That's why the subtitle is New Choices. Right. Uh, it's not just new constraints. And, and this, this, there's good news in this, I think. Now, at the same time, there are many people who want to have children, men and women, who, because they don't have support from their organizations, from our society, and these are questions I get into in the recommendations, mm -hmm. um, you know, can't figure out how to make it work. Uh, but then there are those who are choosing not to, and for good reasons. They don't want it. And I see this as progress, that people are able to choose uh, to not become parents because not everybody wants to, nor should everyone become a parent. Sure. And that, that's mirrored, as you note in the book, by, um, by national trends as well, right, about uh, the average number of births per family um, and just what's happening within population trends within the country. Yeah, the uh, the downward trend in uh, becoming parents, uh, you know, over the last twenty years, uh, our data kind of reflects national trends. Sure. All right. So it's I mean, not just not just Wharton students. Absolutely. What what else feels really important to you um, about you know we we're talking about women um, for a little bit here. What feels really important to you about changing perceptions um, for women today versus this study twenty years ago? Women seem to be more realistic about what it's going to take to be successful in their lives. Uh, and they're more interested, uh, according to our study, in um, friendships, mm -hmm. in networks, and in being respected uh, in their work and in their lives. They're also more interested in doing work that has uh, positive social value. Mm. They want to help others mm. uh, more than the prior generation. And one of the striking findings uh, that we observed is that the more uh, that you wanted to be engaged in providing social value through your work, the less likely it was that you would become a mother. So it's almost as if right. uh, there's a competition between serving the family of humanity versus the family that you might create uh, sure. with your own children. Sure. And, and this links to other work that you've done. I mean, I know within your book, Total Leadership, mm -hmm. you think about the self Right? You think about the family, the career, and the community. Yes. So for, um, for men and for women, what advice do you have um, to move away from an either-or mentality, either family or career, to one where you can integrate both of them? Right. So in the, uh, in the recommendations uh, sure. in the book, uh, Baby Bust, we, I address what do we need to do as a society, what do, we need, what do organizations need to do, and then what can individuals do? Mm -hmm. And what we have found with this Total Leadership Program, that's also a course here that uh, has been oversubscribed for years now, sure. uh, there's a lot of young people who are interested in, it, in tackling the question of what does it mean for me to be real, to, to right. clarify what matters most to me in terms of my values, my vision of the kind of leader I want to become, the kind of world I want to create, to be whole? Who are the most important people in the different parts of my life, and what do they really need from me, and how can I serve them well? Mm -hmm. And then to be innovative, to be continually experimenting with how things get done. 
And I reserve a special section in, at the end of Baby Bust for how these uh, issues and this method can be used by young men who uh, I find are very confused uh, because mm -hmm. th there is a, we're in a moment in history where uh, things are changing and changing fast and the models that they grew up with are different than the models that they want to create. And so the, the total leadership approach essentially uh, helps you to see what matters most to you and then to figure out how to take creative action uh, th that's within your control uh, that helps you to align your actions with your values in a way that serves the people around you that you care about. Sure. And what the experiments are that people do uh, to, um, to practice and to develop this mindset are uh, in pursuit of what I call four-way wins. Mm -hmm. Small actions that you can take that demonstrably improve your work, your home, your community, and yourself. And by trying to do that in the laboratory of our course, you develop new insights about what's possible in terms of how to integrate the different parts of your life in a way that works for all of them. And by practicing that and seeing what's possible, and usually what people discover is that they have more control and more um, a sense of agency and capacity to bring the different parts together, they realize that uh, that they can do that in, in you know as they as they grow in in different uh, parts of their career, different stages of their career. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. And one of the things that you talked about within the book, um, you presented this metaphor, right? Which which also resonates to me as I think about establishing, managing boundaries, integrating life. You talked about the double dutch metaphor, right? You yeah. can actually jump two ropes at once. Um, and you point to people like Richard Fairbanks from Capital One or John Donahue from mm -hmm. eBay. Um, what did you see in their lives and in their careers uh, that could resonate with today's graduates? These are two of many, many examples that sure. are out there that give a lie to the myth that you have to sacrifice everything in order to be successful in your career. Uh, what I have seen time and time and time again in my own life and in the people that I study and work with and consult with is that um, people are more successful in their careers to the extent that they don't divest of the rest of their lives, their families, their communities, their personal lives, you know, mind, body, and spirit. But in fact, they are more successful in their careers to the extent that they invest in those other parts, that there's mutual gain to be had. And these, these two executives are just two of many examples uh, that I've been studying and that I'll be writing about in another book next year that I hope we can talk about. Um, uh, so, but the common myth there is that you have to give up everything. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true. Now that's not to say that you know sacrifices aren't needed, and that you know there's there's pain and disappointment. And of course, we all face that. Uh, but what is possible, and what I'm hopeful about, and what the results of the baby bust um, research tells us is that uh, because men and women are now more aligned in their views about what it takes to make life work, mm -hmm. uh, especially dual career relationships, we're seeing a lot more experimentation, a lot more working together, men and women, private and public partnerships, mm -hmm. in creating models that are different than the ones that you and I grew up with, right. uh, and uh, demonstrate that it, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game, mm -hmm. and that uh, there are different models of career and of family that can work. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a long, slow process. Cultural change is a slog. and. It takes years and years and years and years, and it happens in part through the stories that we tell. Right. Well, I want to return, and we started this conversation, uh, and you said, look, policymakers, organizational leaders, they're some of the folks that you hope are reading the book, um, and that they're also the ones responsible for leading this kind of change that you're talking about. Uh, in the, in the last chapter of the book, you have recommendations. Yeah. Um, so could you talk about some of those recommendations? If you're a CEO, if you're leading human resources practice, um, how can organizations start to change to support um, these kinds of four-way wins, integrated lives? It's such an important question. Uh, and, and it's not just organizations. It's social and educational policy, and then it's sure. what individuals can do. But for organizational leaders, uh, the key is uh, making flexibility real mm -hmm. uh, and using the power of digital communications, 
technology to enable uh, f real flexibility in terms of where, when, and how work gets done. And most importantly, today in 2013, to, um, to make heroes of the people who are successful in, in figuring out new models for how to get work done. And that is going to help us overcome the stigma of flexibility, which a number of researchers, uh, Joan Williams, Shelley Carell, and others, are writing about and talking about and demonstrating is still very, very real for men and for women mm -hmm. uh, for, for taking you know, flexible work options. It's, it's stigmatized in most organizations. And you, you overcome that. Mm -hmm. You help to overcome that by uh, demonstrating that uh, flexibility works, and the best way to do that is to tell individual stories of people who are successful in both their work and in the rest of their lives, whatever matters most to them, whether it's family or, you know, social issues or religious issues, you know, whatever it is. Uh, it's not just about kids. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that's, that's an important function that, that businesses can play. In addition to providing uh, you know, flexible uh, benefits and other kinds of policies. But the real issue is culture and cultural change. And uh, again, the, the models that are promoted mm -hmm. as valued will make it, e make it easier for, um, for others to see, ah, well, if Jeff can do that, well, maybe I can try that, uh, so long as it's going to help the company and me. So it can't be just about me and my kids and my needs and, you know, my emotional state, it's what changes can I make that work well for me and for our organization? So, Stu, you've, you've been at this for, for 20 plus years, right? Thinking yes. about the work life, work life balance, the work life integration project that you've led here at the school. Um, this is obviously a topic uh, that, you are, that you're deeply connected to, that you're passionate about. Um, where does it go from here? You mentioned, I mean, some of the things that you'll be doing going forward, but where does the research go? Well, one of the things we want to do is to uh, mine the data that we collected about the class of 1992 to learn more about how they have evolved and how they see their futures. Um, and then I'm expecting that in 2032 we'll, we'll uh, survey that class uh, to see what they're thinking. Uh, and, and we'll be doing more um, you know, ongoing research of, of Wharton students and alumni to just continue to track their values and their interests in, in the different parts of their lives. Uh, what I'm most excited about now is uh, tonight we are launching uh, the Student Advisory Board for the Work-Life Integration Project. And we've got a couple dozen students at all levels in both MBA and undergrad who are really eager to uh, help use this research as a platform and really as a catalyst for creating a new kind of conversation on our college campus and in other college campuses to invite and um, inform young men and women to start to talk about what these issues mean for them now, because it's clear that the sooner uh, we engage in real conversation about what our interests are, uh, men and women, in shaping and leading the kind of lives we want, the much more likely it is that, uh, that those dreams will be fulfilled, because no one's going to hand it to these kids. They're going to have to forge it themselves. They're going to need our help. Uh, and I think it starts with... Uh, with dialogue informed by research.